In my last video, we explored the mysterious black goo inside the Osiris shaft. We delved into how scientists at the British Museum were able to analyze samples of Egyptian black goo from New Kingdom coffins and beyond to determine composition, unlocking a variety of fascinating information, both symbolic and practical. We also had an in-depth look at the mysterious sticky substances, spiritual significance throughout history, symbolizing regeneration in Egypt and the god Osiris. But here's where things really start to get sticky. While the tests reveal certain properties about Egyptian black goo, they weren't from samples taken directly from the Osiris shaft. So can we really conclude that this is the case for the Osiris shaft? Or could there be a hidden truth out there awaiting discovery? Before we further investigate, I invite you to click that subscribe button if you're new here. Also, be sure to click the bell icon so you can receive notifications when I drop new videos like this one. Scientists from the British Museum analyzed over a hundred samples of the black goo to establish how ancient Egyptians made the fluid. They identified the black goo as an amalgamation of animal fat, tree resin, beeswax, and crude oil from the Dead Sea. In the New Kingdom, coniferous resins were imported from Lebanon and they would have had a more acidic smell. But when we explored the Osiris shaft during our Adept Expeditions tour, we noticed that the enigmatic black goo on the stone box smells strongly reminiscent of petroleum. It turns out that bitumen, one of the ingredients identified by the scientists and a material used in the Old Kingdom period would have made sense to be applied here if only there wasn't one tiny problem. Egyptologists. Well, not Egyptologists, they aren't the problem. But Egyptologists date the monolithic stone burial box to the 26th dynasty, nearly 2,000 years after the Old Kingdom. So now we have to ask if the black goo in the Osiris shaft is really an ancestral secret kept throughout the ages, some sort of symbolic substance from antiquity, or is it something else going on here? Only one thing's for sure, our investigation continues. But before we further investigate, let's take a moment to pause and reflect on the marvels of modern technology. While we often take a step back in awe of our ancient ancestors' unusual accomplishments, let's not forget to give ourselves a pat on the back too. After all, modern day technology is nothing short of miraculous. YouTube, for instance, and channels like this one have made it easier than ever to take part in mystery solving. We've been able to study ancient technologies and ruins, examine ancient artifacts and esoteric symbolism, and even visualize the sites of ancient civilizations without leaving the comfort of our homes. It's really amazing to be able to tap into all of these ancient sources of knowledge. And even more thrilling when someone makes an unexpected comment on one of your videos, proposing an alternative theory that could travel off the beaten path and lead us somewhere new. Like this comment on my last video, left by 313 Barry Gmail, who questioned if the black goo was oil used in modern times to lubricate the water pump. With thought-provoking questions like this one from the community here on this YouTube channel, we may even be able to solve this mystery together. So then, was this strange substance applied thousands of years ago? Or could there be something more modern at play? Could modern Egyptian workers have spilled oil during maintenance? We're searching for answers hidden deep inside the mysterious Osiris shaft, below the surface, but to really get a sense of what we might find down there, it's time to get clued up on some history above ground. The Giza Plateau, where the Osiris shaft is located next to the pyramids, is in the desert region of Egypt and generally receives very little rainfall, averaging about 2 inches or 50 millimeters annually. So it is a commonly held belief that Giza didn't receive much rainfall in ancient times. But in all actuality, the legendary fall of Atlantis or the end of the Younger Dryas period is not the only occasion where Giza could have experienced immense rainfall. 
And in a land where it allegedly never rains, when it does, it pours. In fact, in the Old Kingdom, rainfall was not only present, but it presented a pretty serious problem for pharaohs of the 5th dynasty. You can learn more about climate change in the 5th dynasty by reading through the variety of academic papers available on this subject. Most of the climate change was a result of rainfall in Ethiopia, but the rainfall eventually declined in Egypt as well. Between the 5th and 6th dynasty, Giza experienced extreme rainfall, sometimes in large deluge. I spoke with a fellow researcher, Shlomo, who has been studying this for years, and by his calculations, almost a million gallons of water could have come crashing down on the pyramids. The Great Pyramid of Khufu complex consists of about 13 acres. Khafre's Pyramid, 11 acres. Add to that the Khufu East Cemetery, 8 more acres, and the West Cemetery, 12 acres. It all starts to add up, and we have this displaced water gathering up that would have to be absorbed by sand, now falling on polished limestone and bedrock exposed by sand removal. All we have to do is take the rate of rainfall per year and multiply it by the 43 acres, and more converted to the unit of rainfall to get the flow rate. 43 acres is 174,015 meters. Rainfall is 200 millimeters, that is 0 0.02 meters. 0 0.002 meters times 174,014 square meters is 3,480,280 liters of water. That's nearly a million gallons of water displaced and flowing per year. And sometimes you get that in one storm once or twice a year. And we should also take into consideration how that is just from the surface area of the buildings, not from the exposed bedrock that used to be covered, like streets and causeways or quarries, which you would have to multiply the runoff perhaps four times more for those. Needless to say, that's a lot of water, not absorbed by sand, running off and creating all sorts of problems. Again, sometimes in large deluge, as evidenced by washout damage extent on the plateau. You can see the scars here on the plateau. So when you have a 13 acre pyramid complex on this site, and then another 11 acre pyramid next to it that you inherited from your ancestors, who didn't have to worry as much about this problem that you are now confronted with, having this overwhelming rainfall cascading down the pyramids, creating a deluge, overflowing onto the necropolis, threatening nearby tombs, you really have to consider evolving technology to remedy the problem. And that is just what the ancient Egyptians of the 5th dynasty did. These water wizards were then learning on the fly and responding to the rain problem by implementing a drainage system to deal with water runoff. The mitigation of water damage is the reason why we still see mud brick dams built up around Giza in some of these vintage photos. You can see the evidence here. So there is abundant evidence of large scale downpours after the construction of the 4th dynasty pyramids that required water mitigation, including the Wall of the Crow. But the 4th dynasty pyramid builders didn't have anything downslope to protect, except for the valley and Sphinx Temple. Minor protections were implemented in the 4th dynasty, but toward the end of the 4th dynasty and the start of the 5th dynasty, the central field cemetery began to be dug up. And these shafts you see here were sunk at that time to serve as protection to hold the water. The water would run off down the slope and then drain down into the shafts so that it didn't flow down any further and damage the necropolis. So 5th Dynasty Egyptians held the water in these large pools. But the pool of water has to go somewhere. They weren't going to wait around for it to evaporate, so the ancient water wizards had to find another way to make it disappear. They would channel it down into the ground where the rock is most porous, so the limestone effectively soaks up and absorbs water naturally. How does this work? The Osiris shaft is located beneath the causeway between the Khafre Temple and the Sphinx. So it's in the same vein as the Sphinx geology, which is very complex, as I explain inside the Sphinx enclosure during my adept expedition tours, and could be viewed as a layer cave. Sphinx geology is very complex. If you come over here for a moment, we'll just give you a crash course Sphinx geology 101. So 
to really understand this, number one, the Sphinx is not your great granddaddy's Sphinx. It's had many restoration periods over time. We'll discuss it as we walk around. And the geology isn't just one surface. You actually have three separate levels of rock strata. Geologists here refer to as member one, member two, and member three which can get confusing because you may not know if you're gonna label the top number one or the bottom number one. So Shock uses a different convention. He refers to it as the lower, middle, and upper, and that's what we'll use today. So in other words, if you look over here at this bed of limestone, the Mokatam Rock Formation, it actually dips under the, it goes through the pores and dips to the other side, which I'll show you in a minute. That is the lower member. The Sphinx geology is like a layer cake. That's the lower member. And then in the back, we see uh, the ridge and all through the body, that's the second member. And then up above is the head, which is the hardest. So it has alternating levels of soft and hard levels of limestone. The head being the hardest, which has been subject to the most erosion because the Sphinx has been buried under the sand numerous times throughout history. So again, we have three separate levels. In order to develop a clearer picture, we have to first better understand what the original purpose of the shaft was. To do this, we are not merely looking up at the surface, but looking beneath it. So we have three levels of rock strata, of alternating hard and soft levels of limestone all above a shoal reef. The height of the bedrock layer boundaries in this image are based on the average thickness of those layers superimposed over various tiers or levels inside the Osiris shaft. And when you look at level one and level two of the Osiris shaft, you'll notice how both chambers are entirely inside soft layers of bedrock. Shaft one is located entirely inside member two bedrock, the softer bed, which would make it suitable for water absorption. And you can see here, shaft two is located in the porous pneumolite bank, which again creates an environment conducive for allowing water to pass. This provides us with a clue for the original intent of the Osiris shaft. This insight informs us that the Osiris shaft was modified into a tomb only after it was first used as a water drainage system. And we are proposing that both chambers were originally intended to collect or pool water. This means that shaft A and level one were first dug into the soft limestone, but it wasn't adequate for drainage. So it was then expanded by cutting shaft B all the way down through the hard layer until they reached the next layer of soft limestone, the pneumolite bank down below, effectively positioning level two inside the highly porous pneumolite bank below. Notice here how that steep descent of shaft B, where that long, terrifying ladder is in the shaft, extends beyond member one, the hardest layer, all the way down into the pneumolite bedrock where water can be best absorbed. You can see how both levels one and two and their corresponding shafts are similar in style, cut in this L shape with ascending floors. And at the very bottom, the final shaft, C, and level 3, the so-called Tomb of Osiris, would likely be cut much later, along with the subchambers on level 2, where they were cut to receive the monolithic boxes and wooden coffins that were brought down, likely in the 26th dynasty. So the first two levels were cut into the rock during the 5th dynasty, and the lowest level cut almost 2,000 years later in the 26th dynasty, along with the subchambers in level 2 for the purpose of burials. Notice how shaft C goes straight down, typical for 26th dynasty burials, and the chamber below differs from the previous two chambers. Although it's not unreasonable to conjecture that level 3 could have been cut at the same time as the first two levels in order to use every drainage strategy available. Whatever the case, it was filled with water in 1934 when Egyptologist Salim Hassan first began excavating. As mentioned in my ultimate guide to the Osiris shaft that you can watch here on this YouTube channel, four years were invested into pumping water out, but this effort was unsuccessful. The water was not entirely pumped out until the 1998 excavation led by Zahi Hawass. But Boris Said had explored the shaft prior to Hawass's excavation and noticed the water pump still down there, a remnant of the Hassan excavation. And if you watch this video, you'll notice it's still down there. And this is our next clue. 
We've got a real blast from the past here. This classic flywheel was part of an iconic Myers model water pump, like the one you see in this photo here. They were all the rage back in the 1930s, and there can be little doubt that this is the same exact pump used by Salim Hassan's workmen to pump some serious H2O in 1934. Peering closer, we find an intriguing surprise. The flywheel is still covered in oil and has a wire tube attached to it. Could this be our next clue? Let's take a peek inside the mysterious monolithic box itself, located just across the chamber. You can't help but be intrigued with the contents of this mysterious box. A closer look reveals a strange electrical wire tubing, almost identical in appearance to the one we've just seen. Could this be the same material? Perhaps some sort of fence wiring? Answering that question may prove vital for discovering what lies ahead. The presence of wire markings would make it modern wire, like the ones we see here. And identifying the age of wire found in the box within a reasonable margin may be possible. But when zooming in to take a closer look, we can't see any markings on this wire. But the conductor could tell us something. This seems to be a two-conductor wire, with each separately insulated and color-coded. There are areas where there seems to be a texture to the insulator and others where it seems to reflect light and even be shiny. Now, some of the pictures we find of old fabric coated wires have both of these properties. And here's an electrical wiring history timeline. This table gives us approximate dates of origin and use of various types of electrical wires used in buildings. And it shows us what was available in the 1930s. Notice how thick our wire is. It's an 8 or a 10 gauge wire, which is very thick. This is old school wiring, common in the 1930s. It wasn't until after World War II that industrialization reduced the size of wire with more efficient copper wiring. It also has two wires, like we mentioned. One is copper, the other is aluminum, with no ground. This is because grounding cables were introduced in the 1940s. This is likely the electric cable that ran the motor on top of the water pump. But let's not get our wires crossed just yet, because not only do we see the wire, which we know now is from the 1930s, but we can also see how the wire is under this sticky substance. This could only mean that the oil is modern, not the ancient Egyptian black goo. So, the sticky substance dripping down the lid is modern oil used for the water pump. But why do we see the oil on top of the wiring inside the box? Could they have been using the stone box as a tank for pump oil? Not likely. To begin with, dumping oil in the box would be a waste because you'd contaminate the oil with whatever sand is at the bottom and whatever dirt, trash, and whatever else was in there at that time. So you wouldn't be able to use the oil. But you could place a perfectly good oil barrel with a tap on top of the lid toward the front in the 1930s. And if that is oil, then it must have leaked inside. It doesn't seem to go up the walls. This could be from a bad tap or even from sloppy handling by disgruntled employees sent into a wet dock hole to oil a pump. We really don't know. But when we consider how the pump was installed some 90 years ago, and Zahi Hawass didn't go in until some 20 years ago, you have to consider how there is almost 65 year period between the Hassan and Hawass excavation where you don't really have anybody working down there. If the oil drum was left down there in the 1960s, it's already disintegrating and rusted out, causing leakage, which then spills down the lid and drips inside the box. This would explain why we don't see the oil going up the walls at the far end. It's consistent with something being stored on top of the front of the sarcophagus lid. But if a rusty oil drum is leaking down, how do you explain the black goo splattered on the ceiling above? Well, when I first pointed this out to our geologist, What about this up here? What would cause this to the stone? She suspected it was some kind of mold. I thought maybe it was stachybotrys because it's black. And unlike the sticky substance oozing down the lid of the box, the patch on the ceiling appears to be dry. And since they didn't pump out all the water, the entire area is moist. And you need that kind of moisture for lichen to grow. Lichen is a type of symbiotic organism classified as fungus. 
They breathe carbon dioxide and release oxygen that leaves carbon behind. So wherever there is lichen growing, it leaves a carbon scoring on the rock and you'll usually see a blackened area around it like this. This crust is left on the limestone. You'll see it's almost all black and white. If you have oil down there or any kind of biologics being brought in that could bring in the lichen which thrives in low light whereas plants will not, it can't exist in no light which is why we don't see lichen inside the sarcophagus. So you have oil in there, you have wires in there, but you don't have any lichen down there inside the box. But you do see it on the ceiling above and on the walls like you see here in this photo where it's white. Anywhere you see lichen on the ceiling or walls is probably where a light source was once being kept. Sure enough, here's a photo taken by Robert Temple after Zahi's excavation, and we can see that there was even a light fixture here in the same spot aiming right at the location. You can see the lichen here. And then they thrive in that light. And when light sources went away and people went away, the lichen stopped growing, it turned to crust and it just left this skeleton behind. This is what we see on the ceiling today. So in conclusion, the mysterious ancient Egyptian black goo inside the Osiris shaft is modern oil. An oil barrel was placed on top of the lid and either sloppy maintenance work resulted in drippage or more likely rust over time leaked leaving this sticky substance on the inside of the sarcophagus. And what we see on the ceiling is dried up crusty remains of dead lichen which once thrived in the low lights and moist environment using biologics as a food source. Two years of continuous operation would build up stains like this and we know Hassan's workmen were operating down here for four. So case closed. And while the mystery of the black goo inside the Osiris shaft may now be solved, there is another mysterious substance known as the blood of Osiris. This is a more esoteric topic one with far more profound implications that we'll be exploring in a forthcoming presentation exclusively for private members of my Ancient Egypt Mystery Schools membership site. If you feel called to learn more, you can become a member at ancientegyptmysteryschools.com. You can find a link in the description down below. But if you still have any doubts about the sticky substance inside the Osiris shaft being modern, you could always verify the time period of the petroleum stains by lead content. You could conduct a professional chemical analysis of the stains to determine the concentration of lead present there within. Lead was commonly added to gasoline up until the 1970s. So the presence of a significant amount of lead in the stains would suggest that they are from that time period or earlier. The Osiris shaft isn't open to the general public, but if you'd like to sample it for yourself, you may want to consider joining one of my tours of Egypt. And thanks to AdeptExpeditions.com, you'll have an opportunity to access this rarely visited site. But the Osiris shaft isn't open to the general public. So if you'd like to sample it for yourself, you may want to consider joining my next tour of Egypt. Thanks to AdeptExpeditions.com, you'll have an opportunity to access this rarely visited site. And joining one of my tours is a great way to support my work and research. You can also support this channel and my research via Patreon. I'll leave a link down below. Thank you so much for watching. And if you enjoyed this, give it a like. And if you like this, watch the next two videos I put up on the screen because they're the videos YouTube thinks you should be watching next. Thank <laughs> you.